<laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean, there, there is a model where you say, I only want three states, but you can have as many symbols as you want. And you can probably make a trade-off like that. But you can't restrict everything. All right, so I talked about a universal Turing machine. That's a Turing machine that takes other Turing machines as input and then executes them. So it doesn't have any kind of computation of its own, so to speak. It's not doing a square or a cube or, or checking for palindromes. All it does is take other descriptions of Turing machines and do them, whatever they do. So this machine can do anything. You write a program, a Turing machine program that you want to do, and you send it to this machine, and it'll go ahead and execute it. Usually you'll send it the machine along with an input. And you'll say, simulate this machine on this input. You'll send in two things. In Alan Turing's paper, you can read a description of a universal Turing machine. It's very mechanical, a little tedious. You know, it says, look over here, see what state you're in, see where it says you should write, go over here, move to the tape. It's just you're looking at a description of a program, and, it, and this universal Turing machine simulates that description. Just for some interest, you can write a universal Turing machine with seven symbols on your alphabet, five states, and one tape. You do that for homework. I don't know what it looks like. But you can, there, is, there are universal Turing machines that have just this simple structure. Now, yeah, and you have a question? <coughs> I don't know if it's the smallest. I don't think there is any, quote, smallest, because to make a universal Turing machine, we have to say how we're going to encode Turing machines. There's a lot of different ways to encode Turing machines. You could, you could, you know, just turn them into characters and then turn those into binary by ASCII. You could, you could count the number of states and put that in binary, and then put the transitions like we did for finite state machines into sequences of zeros. There's lots of ways to encode a Turing machine. And depending on how you encode it, this universal Turing machine is going to be very different. So you have to decide what Turing machines look like in binary, and then this universal Turing machine can be explicitly constructed. So to say what the smallest one is depends very much on how you decided you were going to encode your Turing machines. And depending on how you encode it, this could be bigger or smaller. But this is certainly, the idea is to show you that it doesn't have to be some huge crazy machine, and you can really do it. Most people don't do it, but you can find it somewhere, and you can do it yourself. There are books by Roger Penrose called the, I think called The Emperor's New Mind, um, and some sequel to that book, which is a, re, uh, he takes Alan Turing to task for the idea of artificial intelligence. And he says, I don't really think machines are ever going to be like humans, and here's why. And in that book, he does a review of computational complexity, quantum mechanics, neurobiology, and puts it all together and makes his, uh, makes his point. In that book, there's an actual universal Turing machine that he writes, or he describes, in pretty much detail. So that's another place you can go find one. And it's a worthwhile book. It's, uh, it's interesting reading. What, what does this machine take again? It takes another Turing machine. It takes another Turing machine and an input, and, and, and it executes that other Turing machine on that input. On input. Right. It gives the output. Exactly. It just does what that other Turing machine would do. And, and really, it's this existence of a universal Turing machine that Alan Turing used to justify the generality of his model of computation. If this is really a general model of computation, I should be able to write some program on it that reads all the other programs. For example, let's say he picked a finite state machine as his model of computation. There is no universal finite state machine that reads other finite state machines and simulates them. Far from it. There's not even finite state machines that easily recognize strings that are other finite state machines. Finite state machines are idiots compared to this model. I mean, this model is really very, very self-aware and, and a completely general model of computation, so much so that you can write a program that reads other programs and simulates them. And it's this, this idea of a universal Turing machine, which is going to be at the heart of all the decidability things that we're going to talk about pretty soon. E.G., you got a question? Other questions? Neil, questions? It seems surprising there's so many different languages. Because, you know, you can do it all in one. Yeah, well, well, think of all the different assignments you had this year in programming. 
and all the two million programmers who write programs every single day, right? And they don't have to go ahead and build a new machine every time they have a program. All they do is type their program in, and the same Pentium 3 does it. And that's exactly the same idea here. It's exactly the same idea. The, the machine language behind you know, your Pentium 3 is this universal Turing machine. The fact that everything that can be converted and simulated by some machine at the underlying bottom level, that's what this is saying here. But yeah, I mean, it is a little surprising. And when you first try to do it, it seems a little bit uncomfortable. But you can really just do it. I should say, though, that when you send a Turing machine into a universal Turing machine, it can simulate it just fine. But it can hardly do anything as far as answering interesting questions about the Turing machine that you sent in. If I send in a Turing machine to a universal Turing machine, it'll simulate it. I can write a program that takes Turing machines and tells you how many states they have. It just counts the states you know, in the description. I can write a Turing machine that looks at other Turing machines and tells you uh, how many symbols are in the alphabet. But I can't write a Turing machine that does anything more clever than just simulate. I can't write a Turing machine that takes other Turing machines and says, oh, this Turing machine definitely accepts you know, the set 0 star 1 among the many things it accepts. Things like that are hard to do. Basically, the most you can do is simulate. You can't do anything more clever in general. Programs are so general that if you try to make a finite collection of reasons why something interesting about them is true or not true, you will fail. There's basically an infinite number of different things that, that make Turing machines act one way or the other. So simple questions like, will they go into an infinite loop? There's no way to do. And we'll talk about that very soon. Other questions? Sure. Sure. A universal Turing machine, remember, what's it expecting? It's expecting an input, which is a Turing machine and some string, right? So you could give this another universal Turing machine along with the input to that, which would be some other Turing machine and a string. And this universal Turing machine would simulate the universal Turing machine simulating that thing. Sure. Like an emulator. More like an emulator. But compiler, not so far off either. Right? It's a lot like an emulator. It's just like, here's a machine that's running your program, and here's another machine that can run any program, but that machine is going to run it by simulating your machine simulating the program. Sure, you can do that. So is this a connection then between the Turing machines and the lambda calculus? The idea that you can sort of take, take an operation and put it into Sure, right. You, you should definitely get that intuition. The lambda calculus is just as general a method of computation as Turing machines. You might wonder why you know, Church's lambda calculus didn't end up being the basis of computational complexity. Why did this end up being the basis? And it's because scientists like this better. It's easier to prove things with this, and the lambda calculus is just, I mean, it's kind of fun and it's neat, but it's just hairy and terrible to prove things with. It looks like scheme. It looks just like scheme. Um, I think you had an exercise that was up on the, uh, the pad trying to use the lambda calculus to generate integers. So you'd use procedures to represent integers. And then procedures calling other procedures that would give you a successor function and give you subsequent integers. And just to do something simple, like defining integers and then defining addition was, I don't know, something long, some some 200 line scheme program. Not that this is much more elegant, but, but it's just more, you know what it's like? It's like the difference between thinking, in some ways, the difference between thinking about expressions and about machines. It's easier to think about computation through machines rather than through a gram or through an expression. I think that's why people picked it. At least it's, well, historically, it was just a choice. Right. So Turing was. 24, when he wrote this uh, Turing machine paper. And then he wrote that AI paper in 1950, when he was uh, 38. And then he died in 1953, I think. He was 41 years old. It's amazing how young he was. And he committed suicide. He was oppressed for being a homosexual, and he was um, 
there was a, uh, a court case against